Good evening, folks, and welcome to our Bible study um, here on Wednesday, the 6th of January, 2021, just as we start back again into the book of Hebrews. As we do so at the start of a new year, start of this new chapter, let's just pause, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day that you have given to us. Thank you for your goodness to us this day, for all your provision for the meals that we have had, for the, the warm clothes that we've had, for roofs over our heads. And Lord, thank you most importantly for the freedom now to be able to spend time round your word. Lord, help us to set aside the busyness of today, the things that have weighed us down, the things that have distracted us and troubled us. Lord, we hand them over to you now and just ask that you would calm and still our hearts as we come to your word. There's so much going on in our land at this time. Father, there's so many things for us to worry about and trouble about. And we do remember those people who at this time are suffering because they are ill in hospital with COVID or recovering at home. And we especially remember those who have lost loved ones to COVID. It's been a difficult time, Father. It's been a difficult Christmas and New Year for many. But we thank you now that we can know you with us that now that we can start this new year off in a different way, round your word. And Father, we pray that as we do so, that you would use it to speak to us, to encourage us and to challenge us. So Lord, thank you now and always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So folks, we come to um, Hebrews chapter 10 tonight. And... Just as we start, let me read to you the first seven verses. As always, I'm using the New Living Translation. Uh, this is what it says there. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped for the worshippers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written in the scriptures about me. Amen. Let's pause there. This chapter starts to shed light on something very important for us it starts to shed light on exactly what the old system of sacrifice and law meant or pointed to or what signified. Um, it just showed uh, how imperfect, excuse me, we were, how imperfect um, the system was, but it pointed to something that would be perfect. Um, the, the writer talks about how the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim, dim preview of things to come. Look at what God gave to his people. When he brought them out of Egypt, when he declared to them that he was their people, that he was going to be their God, and he wanted them to follow him, he gave them law, he gave them rules to follow, he gave them a structure to society, and he gave them the tabernacle, the place where his presence would be, a place where they could come and ask for forgiveness. And in doing that, he set up for them a system of sacrifices uh, and how they could bring those sacrifices. Some sacrifices were for sin. Um, so you had the slaughter of animals. Their blood was spilt. It was um, sprinkled down the sides of the altar and the body was, of the animal was burnt. You then had 
offerings um, of thanks and thanksgiving. You had grain offerings and, and different things like that. And you had incense that was burnt. And the people had to follow this ceremony. And then once a year, as we've already talked about in Hebrews, the high priest would go into the, the very inner part of the tabernacle and in the temple, the Holy of Holies, and offer a sacrifice for the unforgiven sins of the nation or the unknown sins, sins that hadn't been covered by any other sacrifice. And now the author of Hebrews is telling us that, but God said that he didn't really want these but that they were only to signify what was to come. And, and it points to how, how poor these sacrifices were. I mean, the, the, the author says, sacrifices on the lot system were repeated year, again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing. So the sacrifice only lasted a short time. In effect, the sacrifice for the sin only lasted until the person went out and committed more sin. And then, strictly speaking, they had to come back in again and offer another sacrifice. So you can imagine the constant turnover, the constant sacrificing of animals, the constant smell of burnt flesh. Um, and, and as well, the, the, the author talks about how it only pointed people to their sin and it didn't remove the feeling of guilt because the sin hadn't disappeared. I don't think any of us ever lose the feeling of guilt for doing something wrong. But there's a difference between the time of sacrifice and the time now. The time of sacrifice, there would have been like an urgency upon the people. They were afraid of something happening to them before they got a chance to go back to the temple or the tabernacle and offer another sacrifice. And they would have felt that guilt and they would have nearly felt relief whenever they had offered the sacrifice. Oh, it's good, that's, that, that's, that's it sorted out until they sinned again. But it wasn't perfect, it had to keep being repeated. Whereas Christ's death is a once for all event. And it's not that we should ever lose the, that sort of sense of I've done something wrong, because that's how we learn. But we have that reassurance that even when we do something wrong, we're forgiven. You know, whenever we've accepted Christ as our saviour, we're already forgiven. Jesus forgives us for our sins past and our sins future. All of our sin is covered because we have God's grace. And that's the big difference. Jesus doesn't get crucified on the cross time after time whenever we do something wrong whenever we realize we've done something wrong and we and we we come back and say to god oh, yeah father you know I'm, I'm really sorry for how i spoke to that person i'm really sorry for how i lost my temper oh forgive me god you know and and, and teach me so i don't do that again that's not crucifying jesus again on the cross jesus did that once he only had to do it once because he was perfect because of what this passage says. Let's just read over it again. It says, Those sacrifices, that's the, the ones of the animals, actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. Those sacrifices didn't actually take away the sin, but they pointed towards the sacrifice that would come, that would take away our sin. So a lot of people would say about Old Testament characters, but, but how do we know they're, they're, they're saved? How do we know they're in heaven? How do we know that they're right with God? They followed God's instruction. They followed God's law, which pointed forward to the time whenever Christ would come, die on the cross, be buried and then rise again as the, the perfect sacrifice for sin. So they knew that, well, they didn't realise, they didn't understand, but they, that's what their sacrifices that they were, were, were offering at each time were pointing towards. The fact that Christ was coming to forgive our sins. And the author there, um, that quote which, they, which the author uses from verses 5 to 7, 
is taken from Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer Christ. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it was written about me in the scriptures. Again, the author is pointing to why Jesus came. Jesus came ultimately to be that sacrifice to take away our sins. That's what it was all about. And, and, and that's what the, the author is trying to get these people to realise. Again, maybe these are Jewish people who are listening. Maybe they're non-Jewish people. Who knows? There's probably a whole mixture of people going on. Um, but he's trying to get them to understand. You know, I don't care what you've you know what you've done in the past. Yes, it, it was important at the time. It pointed towards this time. But now this is what happens. Because now there's a new covenant or a new promise or a new relationship a new contract with God as such. Verse 8. First Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, although they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will for us was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. You know, we talk quite often about how the Bible never changes. And yet some people will say, oh, the Bible does change because you've just said that the first covenant is cancelled and there's a new covenant. So yes, it, it can. Do you miss the point then? This was always God's plan. It was always God's plan from Genesis, whenever he's talked about how the offspring of the woman would smite the head of the serpent. It was always God's plan that Jesus would come to be our means of forgiveness. But in order to focus the people, to show them in the meantime, he gave them the law so they could see that there was a cost to sin. Sometimes we forget about that cost of sin. Sometimes we forget about what it costs when we do wrong. If you stand before a, a, a judge in court, you know about the cost of doing wrong. You know, take something simple. You might have been speeding down the road and you know, you're really sorry for what you've done and you've brought the court, you sit out in front of, of the magistrate or the judge and say, I, you know, I'm really sorry for what I've done. I promise I'll not do it again. And the magistrate will go, that's great, I believe you. But there's still a cost to what you have done. You're still going to get a fine. You're still going to get penalty points. You're still going to have to pay the price for what you have done. And God wanted his people and all people to realise that there's still a cost to sin. That's why the animals had to pay the price with their lives. And for us, ultimately, if we don't accept the covenant of Christ... We will pay the price of sin with our lives. But Jesus has paid that for us if we accept him. But we still need to realise that there's a cost to sin. We need to realise that it was always God's plan to send Jesus to be the means of forgiveness. Said God's, verse 10, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all time. We don't have it perfect. We don't have it right. There are things that we will get wrong when we interpret the Bible. But we need to realise that the only thing that forgives our sin, according to God's word, is the death of Christ. Jesus said in himself in John 14, when he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. In the past before we have taught, or different churches have taught about how there's different ways to God. Some churches still teach that. In the past before there's been talk about doing penance, uh, doing purgatory. All of that just points to saying, you know what, yes, Jesus died for you, but it's still not enough, so you still have to pay a price. No, 
if we accept Christ, we don't pay the price. If we accept Christ, he has paid that price. And in fact, he is the only one who can pay that price. So if we try to approach God through any other means, we fail. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Verse 10 again. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Verse 11, under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honour at God's right hand. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. He was perfect. He, he had all the glory of heaven. He left that glory of heaven. He came down to earth at Christmas time, born as a baby into a manger, lived a hard life, was then crucified, died and rose again. Price of sin paid. It's like having a bill and having stamped across it, account settled. And then he sat down at the right hand of God in the place of honour, showing that he is God's son, that he is God, that he is the, what you might say, the heir apparent. You know, this is who I am. I am the son of God and I have paid the price for you. It says in verse 13, there he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by the one offering he made forever, for by the one offering he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Again, if you think of um, the 23rd Psalm uh, and, and how we rely on it so much for strength during life and during death, and how it talks about um, a footstool being made um, of our enemies. You know, Jesus is sitting at God's right hand, waiting for that final day, whenever God will call the account those who run amok in this world, those who cause evil and pain and suffering, those who disobey him. And at that point, everyone will have to acknowledge Jesus as God's son. And it says, for by the one offering he made forever perfect those who are being made holy. Whenever we accept Christ, we talk about two things in, in Christian circles. And we talk about big words. And sometimes we don't explain our big words. We talk about justification and we talk about sanctification. Justification, it, it means we're forgiven. We're made right with God and, and he accepts us. We've got, we've got God's grace. And so we, we know we'll get into heaven. Sanctification is the process by which each day we become more and more like God. In other words, we learn each day more about serving God, following him, living the way he wants us to live. But we don't reach that point until we reach heaven. We will never be perfect on earth because we are still human with human bodies and human minds and we, we will still do things which are wrong. You know, that's what we are like. But it says about how we are being made holy. How do you feel right now? As a follower of Christ, as a Christian, if you're a Christian, how do you feel right now? Do you feel holy? Do you feel that you are right? You probably see all the wrong in yourself and you don't see the right. You know, because that's our natural default is to find the things which are wrong with us. But actually look at what is right in your life. Look, first of all, at how your heart has been cleansed by God because of Christ. How your, your relationship with God has been restored. How it's proper. 
and then see all the good that God is doing in your life each day. All the good that God is using you to do each day. How he is making you holy. And then yes, recognise where you're not holy. Recognise the things that need to change. And ask God to change them. Don't feel guilty about them in that, you know, you, you don't condemn yourself. Recognise and ask God to change. Ask God to continue to make you holy so that each day you can grow closer to him and grow in a closer walk with him. Wow. Imagine God working in our lives. God interested in me and you. God wanting to make us holy. That should excite us. That should humble us. It should show us how much we are loved and how much he cares for us. Let's pray about that right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. Thank you that you are making us holy each day. Lord, help us each day to, to want to live for you, to want to do your will and not our own, to want to, to live our lives in such a way that what we do points people towards you, that people wouldn't see us or see our faults, but rather people would see you. Lord, we realise that means us being changed to be more like you each day. And please do that, Father. Please change us. Please continue to make us holy so that we can serve you better. Until that day, Father, until finally we can meet you in heaven and have our heavenly home. Lord, we thank you. And continue with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining with me this evening. I trust you may know God's peace and God's blessing and I'll see you again next Wednesday as we continue uh, back in the rest of Hebrews chapter 10. In the meantime, Monday to Friday, please feel free to join me as we do our daily Bible readings. We're, we're reading through Proverbs. Um, I do it online every morning at half nine. You can pick it up whatever time during the day or the following day or whenever just to catch up. Uh, but let's just spend that time with God because it's good to do it. But in the meantime, take care. God bless. See you soon.